Um, okay, so I, I will get going. And so I'm going to start talking about uh, clean renewable energy roadmaps that we've been developing over the last 11 years now for countries and cities and states, and in fact, the entire world. And the purpose of these roadmaps is to try to transition all energy worldwide uh, to clean renewable energy. And the purpose is to address global warming, uh, energy security, and air pollution mortality. There are around 7 million people die from air pollution worldwide each year. And most of these are due to energy. And so the goal is to try to solve that problem along with uh, global warming. Uh, where we already have about 1.1 degrees global warming since the early 1900s, and we're trying to avoid 1.5 degrees warming. So I see you got my slides there. So actually, yeah, if you can go to the next slide, or second slide. The idea behind these roadmaps is first to electrify everything or provide direct heat for the remainder. And then electricity and heat would be obtained entirely from wind and water and solar power. So that's onshore and offshore wind, solar photovoltaics on rooftops and in power plants, concentrated solar power, geothermal, hydroelectric, tidal, and wave power. Um, electrified transportation, battery electric vehicles, and hydrogen fuel cell electricity. Hydrogen is produced from wind and water and solar. Uh, we'd electrify heating or heat, so we need electric heat pumps uh, for air and water heating and air conditioning. We'd use the solar hot water heating, some geothermal direct heat. We'd also use district heating and cooling uh, for uh, densely populated areas. Uh, and for industry, we could use existing high temperature industrial processes that are electric, such as electric arc furnace furnaces, induction furnaces, resistance furnaces, dielectric heaters, electron beam heaters, etc. Uh, next slide, please. I should point out that all the electricity would be provided by wind, water, and solar, and the direct heat would also be provided by that. But just to give you some uh, visuals here of the different energy technologies, so we're all familiar with onshore wind, of course, and uh, but the one thing I want to point out is the spacing between the wind turbines here can be used for multiple purposes. Offshore we now have floating commercialized offshore wind farms uh, that will really open up the availability of uh, wind to just much larger areas. Offshore wind in the U.S. could power the entire United States on its own, uh, especially with floating turbines. And so, because it's becoming economically viable now, it's starting to compete even with onshore. Um, next slide, please. There we go. Okay. So, um, so solar is now float. There's so floating solar. There was actually a report I saw from Enro, I think it was from Enrel actually the other day, uh, where there's potential for like 7.5 gigawatts of solar just on uh, reservoirs, uh, hydroelectric power reservoirs. Anyway, uh, you know, solar can be put over canals, uh, waterways, uh, roads now, and of course on rooftops. Next slide, please. So, can somebody let me know if they can hear, if you can still hear me? Okay. Are we on the right slide, Mark? Yeah. Although you can advance it now, one more slide. I was just uh -huh. that um, yeah, electric aircraft and hydrogen fuel cell aircraft are starting to kick off, although. Uh, it'll probably be another 10 to 15 years be before we get commercial 747 type aircraft and also maybe five or so years before we get long distance ships. In terms of storage, um, well, we need electricity storage, heat storage, cold storage, and hydrogen storage. And for electricity storage, I mean, there are already existing technology, CSP, concentrated solar power associated with storage pumped hydroelectric power, existing hydroelectric dams, batteries, flywheels, compressed air, uh, gravitational storage with solid masses, which is something that's coming on now. And I'll show you an example in a second. Uh, for heating and cooling, there's well, been water tank storage for both hot and cold storage, storing cold, long-term long um, storage and seasonal storage in boreholes, water pits, and aquifers. Uh, 
those are really valuable for, especially in high latitudes, uh, to store heat between summer and winter, and then storage of building materials. And we also need storage, of course, of hydrogen for long distance heavy transport. Next slide, please. And so, just to give an example of gravitational storage, uh, the idea is well, if you have extra wind, excess wind or excess solar, you can then use that to run a motor to lift up a concrete block, like on the left, or to push a train up a hill, like on the right, train containing rocks or concrete. And then when you need electricity, you then lower the concrete block on the left or let the train flow down the hill on the right and the motor runs in reverse as a generator. Uh, next, next slide. So, and now <coughs> hot and cold storage, uh, <coughs> this is an example of Stanford University where I work, um, has a, since 2017, has had a fourth generation of heating where they are they replaced a gas uh, cogeneration plant, a natural gas plant that provided 80% of the campus electricity and heat. And so what they did is replace the heat and production with, well, there's two, two chillers and a boiler, and there are heat pumps that take waste heat, and they use that waste heat to raise the temperature of the boiler, and they expel cold, to, and that goes into the chillers. And so there are around 35 kilometers of hot water pipes and about 42 kilometers of cold water pipes that are built around the university. Mm -hmm. So yeah. it's a master heating system that okay. okay. it's not work. That'd be okay with you? Yeah. Um, somebody's uh, microphone. So there's so the, the uh, cold water system sends hot and cold uh, water throughout the university to provide heating and cooling. The electricity is now produced by 10 megawatts of solar and rooftops in the university, plus another 120 megawatts of solar. There was a solar power plant, two power plants that the university bought. The second one is, going, is being constructed now and is going to be finished in 2021, at which point the Stanford will be the first university in the world to be 100% renewable for electricity and heating and cooling uh, together. And so this is a part of district heating. Uh, district heating, though, is only about 6.5% of the U.S. is subject to district heating right now, um, but is better than zero. Uh, but there's a lot more potential for that. Next slide, please. So, uh, and then in terms of this is an under, example of underground thermal energy storage. Uh, this is a uh, town in north of, sorry, south of Calgary, about one hour, called Okotoks, Canada. In 2004 and five, there were 52 homes constructed on the uh, roofs of the garages. Uh, there's a glycol solution. There's a solar collector with glycol solution, and during the summer, when the days are long, that solution is heated and piped to this building on the right where the heat is transferred to water. The water is then piped underground on the ground where the, this field here is a play field that kids play on. It had been excavated and uh, boreholes were drilled with U-shaped, and then U-shaped pipes were put in. And so hot water goes down, transfers the heat to the soil, and then cold water comes up. The cold water goes back and to the building and, tra and transfers its, its uh, well, the, and then, so, go, well, the, I should say there are two loops. There's the glycol solution loop, which is hot water, hot glycol solution comes from the rooftop to the building, transfers its heat to the water, and then the water then takes its heat down under the ground. And then the cold glycol solution goes back to the rooftop uh, where it's heated again. And similarly, there's the, there's the water loop that sends heat uh, to the soil in the summer and then collects the heat from the soil in the winter and provides 100% of the building heating during winter time. And the cost is less than a dollar per kilowatt hour of thermal energy storage uh, for electricity storage that's around, batteries around $200 a kilowatt hour. So this is much cheaper uh, type of storage for storing heat seasonally than it is for storing electricity. Uh, next slide, please. There's a similar type of uh, system uh, in Denmark. Well, there's several of these which are called uh, water pit storage where you basically dig a big hole and make a swimming pool and fill it and insulate it and fill it with water and cover it on the top. And then there are solar collectors that in the summer collect heat and send it to the water, heat the water up to about 80 degrees Celsius. 
and that water is then stored till winter time. And in this case, the hot water in the winter provides about 50% of the uh, city uh, heating in the winter. And so this is also really inexpensive. Uh, next slide, please. And one more type of storage, this is just ice storage. Um, actually, Stanford had a big ice cube under a building starting in 1998. And at night, when electricity price was low, that electricity was used to produce the ice. And then during the day, instead of running air conditioning, which would require electricity, uh, water was run through coils in the ice and sent to the buildings to cool the buildings. And so this was a, this is basically a form of electricity storage, like a battery, except it costs about one-tenth per kilowatt hour, the cost of a battery. But ice storage is done quite a bit in stadiums and hospitals um, around the world. So it's actually an existing technology that just needs to ex be expanded. Uh, next slide, please. There we go. And actually, you can go one more slide. So now I want to talk about um, transitioning individual buildings to just clean renewable energy. And I'm going to give an example of my own home. Uh, I finished this home in 2017, and it has no natural gas going onto the property, and that saved a lot of money on its own because I did not have to pay about a $6,000 gas hookup fee, and I did not need about about six to $10,000 in pipes, and and also now I don't need any natural gas itself. So instead, I have 13.6 kilowatts of solar photovoltaics on the rooftop. Uh, there are four uh, Generation One Tesla wall mount batteries, although only two are kind of active at a time because my utility, PG&E, only let me turn up to due to some esoteric rule they had. But it turns out that's fine. It's actually more efficient with two than four. Um, and the other two can either be used when necessary. If there were a complete power outage, then they do turn on, uh, or when the first two run out. So that really extends the life from 10 years, let's say, or 12 years for the two batteries, and now it's 20 to 24 years for four batteries. Okay, so next slide, please. But in addition, so everything is electric in this home, uh, and for heating and cooling, I have heat pumps, and these are called ductless mini splits, uh, electric heat pumps, air, heat pump air con heaters and air conditioners. And so there's a, there are two outside units, and about 11 of these inside units, which are on the left, and there are no ducts, so it's not like a centralized heater. Well, first of all, heat pumps, as you probably know, are uh, don't create heat. They uh, just move heat from the outside to the inside or move cold from the outside to the inside uh, through, they're just connected, these outside units are connected to the inside units uh, just by uh, small rubber tubes that contain coolant. In any case, they're, because they're only moving heat and cold, they're much more efficient than gas heaters or other type, or even electric resistance heaters using about one fourth the energy. And in fact, I'll show you some examples of how, or an example of how efficient this really is, even on the hottest day of the year in a second. Uh, so so the, the, the heat pumps actually keep the temperature of the house perfect all year, so it doesn't matter how hot or how cold it is outside, the temperature inside is just uh, whatever I set it to, and it's really a perfect temperature. Uh, next slide, please. And, and I should point out with heat pumps, uh, this is an air source heat pump, but in climates where you have lots of snow and it gets very cold, you would uh, probably prefer a ground source heat pump, and there, you can now do that at low cost used to be you'd have to excavate your whole backyard for a ground source heat pump, but now you can actually uh, drill vertically just narrow holes uh, down into the ground deep and, and then extract the heat from the soil. So there's a company in New York that does this called Dandelion, uh, to, and it's very low cost, similar to an air source heat pump. Now for water heating, I also use a heat pump water heater. And in this case, the heat is extracted from the room that the uh, water heater sits in. And again, it uses about one-fourth the energy as a natural gas heater, and it costs a little bit more, but the savings in terms of uh, energy are much greater over the entire lifetime, so it's, it's definitely worthwhile, and the water uh, gets really hot uh, just as I need it. Um, next slide, please. So, um, and then for cooking, for cooking uh, I use an electric induction cooktop which, and most people don't like electric resistance stoves because it's hard to control the temperature. 
But with an induction cooktop, it, it boils water and half the time is natural gas. You can control the temperature very precisely. It cooks evenly in a pot. You do need a stainless steel or iron-based pot because the electricity um, will excite molecules in the pot and the resistance will increase the heat. So as a result, the stove actually does not get hot or very hot. It just gets warm due to conduction of heat back to the stove. The pot gets hot, so you won't burn your hand on the stove, which is another nice feature of it. Uh, next slide, please. So just to summarize, in this home, I have three years of energy use uh, data for, and I also have you know, electric cars. There are two electric cars, um, plus my son brings his electric car home to charge as well. And I'm using 100, well, sorry, generating 120% of all the home and vehicle energy use, which is all electricity. So I'm sending the extra the extra 20% back to the grid. And in California, there are what are, what are called community choice aggregation utilities that take over the generation portion of your bill. So PG&E does the transmission distribution. Silicon Valley Clean Energy is a CCA or community choice aggregation utility that takes over the generation portion. And they will actually pay me uh, at time of use the, the value of the uh, electricity. And in California, there are tiers. So in the afternoon, you can pay up to 55 cents a kilowatt hour uh, if you are paying for, if you're using electricity. And they will, but that's for the transmission distribution plus generation. The generation portion is about 28 cents a kilowatt hour. So that's what they will pay me for my solar electricity uh, if it's produced, let's say, at four in the afternoon. And, uh, and even if I didn't have, uh, even if I did not have my own solar, they can, the CCAs actually procure 100% renewable energy. And so you can, even if you live in an apartment, you uh, consume 100% renew, renewable energies by signing up with a CCA for your generation, which is nice. But for the extra 20% of the electricity I produce, I've received an average of $700 per year from the CCA. So just to summarize, voided a gas, well, these are averages or ranges for typical homes. Um, you know, my value is somewhere in the But my gas hookup fee, like I said, I avoided $6,000. Gas pipes actually you know, closer to $7,000 avoiding. Uh, electric bill, $20,000 per year. You know, I pay no electric bill, no gas bill, no vehicle fuel bill. So typical person can save, or household can save four to $15,000 up front, plus three to 10,000 per year. The payback time with subsidies, which are available it's about five years, and the without subsidy would be 10 years. The solar is warranted for 25 years. You know, the batteries typically last 10 to 12 years. But as I mentioned, I've got two generations of batteries there, and they may last longer. We just don't know yet. Um, next slide, please. But my point is, is it's definitely worth doing if you have a home. Uh, pretty much no matter where you are, you will once you've paid it off, you, you have free electricity and energy uh, until you know, the, the equipment runs out or needs to be replaced. Uh, I want to give you one example of my solar and heating use. On September 6, 2020, which is the hottest day of the year around here, the outside temperature reached 106 degrees Fahrenheit. The inside temperature was 77 because that's what I set it at. And you can see that I produced on that day, still produced uh, about 14 and a half kilowatt hours more electricity that it consumed, and that was sent back to the grid and sold to the grid. But you can see how efficient the heat pumps it is. Well, first of all, the blue, well, the green is the solar production during the day. The blue during the day is the consumption in the house, which is solar PV consumption. Part of that in the morning is charging the battery, because the first thing that happens in the morning is the battery gets charged, then, well, in household electricity is consumed. In this case, we have, there's a lot of heat pump requirements, but as you can see, it wasn't huge, and the solar PV took care of it. Uh, then at night, after the, after the solar PV went down, solar went down, then the battery kicked in, the batteries kicked in and started providing the heat pump energy. Eventually, the batteries drained, and then I needed grid electricity. Again, this is with only two batteries. If I had even one more battery, there would be no red, and that would be all... Uh, of battery or solar electricity. So anyway, the point is, is that if everybody did this, or something, every how every building had heat pumps and solar in California, uh, we would definitely see no blackouts whatsoever because 
uh, we're still producing more electricity than consuming, even using, this is for all energy in the home, including heating and cool, well, cooling in this case. And that's what causes the blackouts as people's air conditioning demand goes up in the afternoons uh, on hot summer days. Next slide, please. And I went, another way to avoid blackouts, this is actually a, a study from a former PhD student at Stanford, uh, Mike Dvorak, who looked at California offshore wind resources. And it's interesting to note that, well, the red line on the top is July. This is up in Cape Mendocino, which is um, far, far northern California. But you'll notice that this, this summertime offshore winds in California are actually uh, faster than any other season. And, and this shows time of day. And you can see also that the, you know, the peak, the second peak of the offshore wind is between, is, is around, you know, 8, 9 o'clock p.m., but it goes up after 4 p.m. So not only do you have more offshore wind in summer, but you also have a peak occurring during the time of, uh, during the time of peak electricity demand. So one of the things that California is lacking is offshore wind. If we actually had, we have a lot of solar and we need more solar, in fact, to, uh, to eliminate the use of natural gas for summer afternoon peaking, but having a lot of offshore wind will also eliminate uh, summer afternoon peaking and evening peaking. And so the combination of, of solar and offshore wind can really prevent black, not only blackouts, but help the state go to 100% renewable energy, which is its goal. There's a law, SB 100, for California to go to 100% renewable electricity. Right now, we're at, on average, in the annual average, 55% renewable, clean renewable energy. That's namely uh, solar, wind, hydropower, geothermal in California. Um, next slide, please. So now, uh, next slide, you can go forward one more. Um, so now I want to talk about, well, can we transition the entire world, including individual countries like the U.S., to entirely clean renewable energy? So we did studies for 143 countries to see, can we transition each country entirely to wind, water, solar? And the end use power demand in 2016 of these countries collectively was 12.6 trillion watts. Uh, we project that would grow in a business as usual case to 20.3 trillion watts or terawatts by 2050. However, if we electrify everything and provide that electricity with wind, water, solar, that goes down 57% to 8.7 terawatts. And of that 57% reduction, 22% is due to the efficiency of battery electric and hydrogen fuel cell vehicles versus internal combustion engine vehicles. 3.4% is the efficiency of electric industry. 13.2% is due to the efficiency of heat pumps over gas heaters or electric resistance heaters. Uh, 12% is due to eliminating all energy required to mine, transport, and refine fossil fuels and uranium. 6.6% uh, is due to energy efficiency improvements beyond business as usual. Uh, next slide, please. So, the, yeah, the nice thing is, without really changing our habits, if we transition, if we electrify everything, then uh, we would... Uh, we would then, we can reduce our power demand by 57%. This kind of shows a similar thing, but it shows a timeline of how fast we want to do this. Well, of course, as soon as possible is ideal, but for practical purposes and, and really to avoid 1.5 degree global warming, we want a, about an 80% transition by 2030 and 100% no later than 2050. So the top line here is if we do nothing, then go, we go up to the maximum uh, and use power demand requirements in 2050. If we go down those five shades, those are those energy efficiency improvements I mentioned that uh, get you down to the 100% line. And we want to then power that 100% renewable by just wind, water, and solar. So uh, next slide, please. And those, so if we average over among all countries worldwide that we examined, uh, we would power that 100% renewables with about 30% onshore wind, almost 15% offshore wind, 11% residential rooftop PV, 14% commercial government rooftop PV, 19% PV power plants, 4% CSP power, 1% geothermal, 5.7% hydro, all of which exists 
right now because we don't have any new hydro in these plans. Uh, and then the rest is tidal and wave power. Uh, next slide, please. And so this, um, this land, well, people ask, well, how much land does this all take up? And this is for, again, uh, 143 countries. And by the way, these countries represent about 99.7% of all uh, global emissions, CO2 emissions, that is. Well, the land requirements, well, we don't need any land for offshore wind. And we don't need any land for tidal power uh, or wave power. Uh, we don't need land, we don't need any new land for solar uh, photovoltaics on rooftops. Uh, we, don't, we don't need any new hydro because it's all existing, a uh, small amount of geothermal. So it's mostly utility PV plus CSP, which takes up about 0.17% of the world's land. And then onshore wind, which is about 0.48%. So it's half a percent, well, 0.65 percent total. And again, the onshore wind is mostly space between wind turbines. A lot of solar PV can go on that space. And so it's, it's not a huge amount. Uh, for comparison, well, in the U.S., it would be about 0.9 percent. But for comparison, the fossil fuel industry in the U.S. takes up 1.3 percent of the entire U.S. land area. And so we would reduce the land use in the U.S. Uh, by transitioning entirely to clean renewable energy. Next slide, please. And the big question is then, can we keep the grid stable? So uh, we did grid stability analyses for 24 world regions accompany, encompass, encompassing the 143 countries. And one of those regions was the U.S. itself, so that was its own country and a region. And we looked at for over three years, every 30 seconds. And I, used a climate model that well, predicts the weather every 30 seconds uh, to predict winds and solar fields uh, everywhere worldwide uh, every 30 seconds. And then for the U.S., then, well, then it would compare the wind and solar production and also have the hydroelectric power and small amounts of tidal wave and geothermal and, and would also use storage and all the storage options that I discussed before plus demand response. And we found that we could match energy supply with demand plus changes in storage, plus losses, plus shedding, including demand response as well, every 30 seconds for three years, not only in the United States, like shown here, but in all 24 world regions and with no loss of load and in multiple ways, in fact. So the bottom plot here shows a 100 day period Every hour, the top plot shows the entire three years for the whole U.S. in, in matching demand with supply uh, continuously. Next slide, please. And I'll, I'll show you the cost in a minute, but I want to show you some results for a new, new study, which uh, just completed, which is, well, what's the correlation between uh, heat load and wind power, and can that be used to try to help match power demand? So it turns out that in high latitude countries, well, in the U.S., there's a four times higher heat load than cooling load uh, in the entire U.S. And if you go to even higher latitude countries, it's even greater. But it turns out that uh, wind, in particular off onshore wind, is very strongly correlated with the heat load in many cold countries. And you can see that from these results. Well, the, first of all, the, this is for the U United States. And you can see uh, the bottom plot just shows wind power output correlated with building heat load. And there's about a 0.73 correlation, R value, and that's a strong correlation. And you can kind of see from the top plot, which shows for entire year, where the blue line is the wind power output and the black line is the heat output. And you can see how it kind of follows, the, the wind follows the heating quite well. So the point is, is that in places that are cold uh, and you have a high heat load and you want to use heat pumps running on electricity, for example, uh, building lots of wind is a good idea. And it turns out in high latitudes, there is a lot of wind as well uh, because the wind output is correlated very strongly with the heat load. And you can see even on the second plot shows on a daily basis how in the afternoon or in the evenings when uh, wind power goes up, that's often when the heat load is the greatest as well. 
So there is a daily correlation and a seasonal correlation. Uh, next slide, please. And this correlation even gets stronger. This is Canada, uh, where the correlation goes up to 0.86, the correlation between the building heat load and the wind energy output. So when we actually then uh, predict, when we model the actual heat load uh, based on the, in a climate model, and so that's what I did here, is I actually modeled the heat load in a global climate model for each country, and then correlated that with the wind energy output, and that's, it actually turns out a way to help match power demand, help reduce the cost of matching power demand with supply. Uh, next slide, please. But back to the um, previous study, this is the, the kind of the cost of energy if we transition the entire world, or 143 countries, to uh, clean renewable wind, water, and solar. So the capital cost of such a transition transition everything is about $73 trillion worldwide. In the U.S., it's $7.8 trillion. China, it's about $16.6. In Europe, $6.2. This is the Green New Deal cost of transitioning the world or the U.S. to entirely clean renewable energy. So it's the Green New Deal energy portion, and that would eliminate all air pollution from energy, eliminate global warming emissions from energy, provides energy security. Per kilowatt hour, it's about $0.09 cents a kilowatt hour worldwide. 9.3 in the U.S., so it's pretty low cost. Um, but this is not the best way to look at it. Let's look at the next slide, which is looking at what's the annual cost that people pay in these different cases. So, well, right now, people, the world pays about $11 trillion per year uh, for all fuel, fuel for all sectors. And that's expected to go up to $17.7 .7 trillion per year in 2050. The health cost based on statistical cost of life, remember around 7 million people die from air pollution each year, it's around $30 trillion per year. Uh, climate cost in 2050 is expected to be about $28.4 trillion per year. So the social cost of energy from fossil fuels is expected to be about $76 trillion per year in 2050. Uh, now, if we replace fossil fuels and uh, with when water solar, the energy cost goes down to 6.8 trillion. Remember, we had a 57% reduction of power demand, so that accounts for most of it. And then there's another 10% reduction uh, due to the cost per unit energy is lower with just wind and solar primarily. So wind, water, solar reduces the energy annual cost, or the ag aggregate cost as we call it, 61%, and the economic or social cost about 91%. So the social cost is the energy plus health plus climate cost. Instead of $76 trillion a year, we're paying $6.8 trillion a year worldwide. And that's because of the um, we have no health or climate cost and we reduce energy costs. So 91% social cost reduction is much cheaper, uh, both from energy point of view and social cost point of view, to go clean renewable energy. Next slide, please. Yeah. So in this, the next slide, actually, uh, can you go one back, one slide back? Yeah, so this is the U.S. alone. Uh, wind, water, solar cost about $770 billion per year. That's just on the order of the military budget. So just to replace all business as usual is basically spending about the military budget in the U.S. And we, again, we reduce energy costs 64% and social costs 87%. So it's a no-brainer to transition to entirely clean renewable energy. Next slide, please. Um, we recently just finished a study looking at uh, 74 metropolitan areas worldwide, including 30 megacities. And so this just shows a similar result, um, but just summing up over all these megacities if we just focus on them instead of the countries. And we get, again, 61% lower energy cost, 90% lower social cost. Next slide, please. Okay, so now I just want to um, talk about the last subject, which is uh, policies and you know what's been done and what can be done. So this was a paper we did in 2009, which was uh, really a, a vision. Is it possible to transition? This is Mark DeLucchi, who's at UC Davis at the time and now at Berkeley and Davis. Uh, we were trying to see, is it possible to transition the entire world for all purposes to just wind and water and solar by 2030? And the conclusion was it's technically and economically possible, but for social and political reasons, uh, a complete transition may not uh, occur till 2050, but hopefully we can get at least 80% by 2030. 
And it turned out that this was the, turned out to be the scientific basis for the Green New Deal, which is a goal of 2030 transition and entirely to clean renewable energy. Uh, although we still think that 2030 timeline is probably a little bit uh, that's optimistic, but it certainly it's a good thing to push for. Uh, next slide, please. But since then, there have been uh, 61 countries that have committed to 100% renewable electricity. These are listed here, uh, mostly smaller countries, but, uh, but still there are commitments. And this is very encouraging. Next slide, please. There are actually uh, 11 countries that are either above or at or just below, really close to 100% renewable electricity in the annual average uh, in actual operation. So Iceland, Norway, Costa Rica, Paraguay, Uruguay, Tajikistan, Albania, Scotland, Kenya, Bhutan, Nepal. These are, these are driven mostly by hydropower, but two countries, uh, Scotland, which is, has mostly wind, and Kenya, mostly geothermal, are not hydropower. And so they're keeping the grid stable um, in all these countries with 100% renewable electricity. So clearly, um, this is something that has been working in practice as well, although uh, there are going to be many permutations. And of course, it's going to be more challenging uh, when we have like no hydro, for example, in some places, because hydro is very good at load balancing. Uh, but again, from all the studies that we've done, and there are actually 11 other groups, at least, that have done 100% renewable studies that find it's feasible um, at pretty much everywhere in the world. Uh, next country, next slide, please. And in the U.S., there have been multiple, in fact, eight laws and resolutions proposed at the federal level. And these are all listed here, uh, but not one has been voted on. And the most recent of these two are the U.S. Green New Deal resolutions in 2019. Um, next slide, please. Uh, the first one, which is House Resolution 540, was actually based on our uh, U.S. roadmaps, and it even stated in the resolution uh, that uh, our study concluded that the United States energy supply could be based entirely on renewable energy and, it, and supported a, a, a policy of transitioning to 100% clean renewable energy uh, for the U.S. But again, even though this had dozens of supporters, it has not been voted on. Next slide, please. Uh, however, uh, there have been 14 states and territories that have uh, either laws or executive orders that uh, resulting from these wind, water, solar roadmaps. And these are all either for 100% renewable energy or what they, some of them call 100% clean energy, which will effectively be renewable energy by 2050 because uh, there are some states that have, for example, nuclear power and those plants will be down by 2050 and they will get their energy from uh, renewables. Now, Rhode Island has a goal of 2030, 100%, Washington, D.C. by 2032, uh, Connecticut, 2040, and the rest either 2045 or 50. Uh, next slide, please. There are also, uh, there are around 170, I think now, 170 plus cities in the U.S. alone and over 300 worldwide that have committed to 100% renewables. And these cities have been uh, prompted. Well, when we did our first roadmaps uh, for states in the U.S., which was back in 2013, we did a New York energy plan. Then, then, we, then we did California, a California plan, and then a Washington state plan in all 50 states. Then um, I helped co-found a nonprofit this is called the Solutions Project, and we worked with the Sierra Club, who then took it on themselves to go to all these cities, and because they have thousands of people in the U.S. worldwide, or sorry, in the U.S. who are uh, very good at uh, going and con convincing places to pass resolutions and laws, and so the Sierra Club took it upon themselves to uh, take these plans to these cities and get them to pass resolutions, and so they did a lot of work on this. Uh, next slide, Nick, please. And the other thing is there are over 230 international companies now that have committed to transition to 100% renewables, including eight of the 10 biggest companies of the world, which are in the blue here. And that, this is really good because they're actually driving a transition and actual implementation of renewables uh, worldwide. Next slide, please. 
And since then, there are also 100 nonprofits that have committed to 100% renewables. And, uh, um, and these, this is driven. So there's really this whole entire movement that has centered around uh, this 100% idea, which is really amazing. And it's something that just happened organically. It wasn't something that was planned originally. But uh, there was this coalescence and that all these nonprofits coalescing around this idea resulted in all these laws being passed in U.S. states and the proposed laws in the federal government and those laws that have been passed nationally. Uh, next slide, I'm almost done here. And finally, you know, what do people think about this? Uh, there was a, been, there have been many public opinion surveys, but this particular one is interesting because it was 26,000 people in 13 countries in 2017. And it said that 82% of the of people in these countries on average wanted 100% renewable energy, but only 66% believed climate change was a global challenge. So the interesting thing is that a lot of people believed in the solution to the problem, but didn't believe in the problem itself. And the interesting thing is that, so why do people want renewable energy, but don't believe in climate change? Well, a lot of people thought renewables make countries more energy independent, boost economic growth, create jobs. There are a lot of reasons people like renewable energy, but don't necessarily believe in climate change. Well, from our point of view, if we're trying to solve the problem, as long as they're supporting the solution, uh, we don't really care if they believe in the problem or not. Uh, so next slide, please. Okay, so just to summarize, uh, and I didn't talk about jobs, but we did find 28 million more long-term full-time jobs than lost due to transitioning, 3 million in the U.S. We'd require only about 0.65% of the world's land for footprint and spacing for this transition, avoid 7 million air pollution deaths per year, slow than reverse global warming. We think we can keep the grid stable throughout the world. Uh, absolute energy costs are 90% lower and social costs are or sorry, 60% lower energy costs, 90% lower social costs due to transitioning. Uh, next slide, please. And finally, uh, if you want more information, here are some links and other information. But uh, since this is probably past my time, I will stop there and try to answer any questions if you have them, if we have time. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Mark. And it's a wonderful presentation. And I would ask uh, participants uh, to unmute yourself and please ask questions directly to Mark. And I see some questions on the chat panel, but I would give opportunity to the participants to directly speak to Mark, please. Yeah, I had the question about like the red or blue text, because some of the countries and cities you had either highlighted them in like red or blue. Did that mean anything or is it just the style? <laughs> oh. Yeah, for the cities, the um, it was just a population. There was one, uh, the, one set. Of, one color was for large cities above a certain population. I don't know if it was like a hundred thousand or something. And the others were smaller populations. Okay, thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Noah. Yeah, there, I see a question about the slides. Yeah, you're welcome to have the slides. Maybe Rob can distribute them to her. He's got them. Yeah, actually, Mark has shared his uh, most recent version of the slide and with his permission, I'll be very happy to share it with the participants. Hi, uh, Mark, it's Clyde Madison speaking from Johannesburg. Yeah, hi. Uh, given that you've been telling the story for some time now, in your opinion, is the biggest thing slowing it down the fossil fuel lobby or the political inertia? Um, well, there's a lot of existing infrastructure that doesn't just disappear, so that's part of it. Um, there, there is the, yeah, certainly the fossil fuel lobby is trying to slow it down. Um, I mean, things are transitioning, but it, well, part of it is also there's a competition with different ideas. And so, like, there's what I call the all of the above policy where people focus on different technologies such as carbon capture or nuclear or biomass. So there's a lot of money that goes into those. And that distracts, I think, from this clean renewable energy, although you know, not much is going into these other technologies as much as before. Uh, and I but I think there's still enough that it distracts. And also there's a lot going into natural gas as well. So it's a combination of factors. But nevertheless, I mean, in June, 
this year, 100% of all the new electric power installations in the U.S. were wind, water, solar, uh, mostly solar and then wind and then a tiny amount of geothermal, sorry, a tiny amount of hydro. Uh, so there is, um, but there is still gas going up if you look at, over the entire year and worldwide there's still a lot of gas and place, some places are still building coal. So, um, yeah, we're moving in the right direction, but not fast enough for sure. Uh, if there are no more questions, uh, I'll give you, uh, folks one more minute if there is. Can you? It's Clyde Madison uh, again. I'm sorry, I've already asked the question, but I'd like to ask another one. Mark, are you available to give a country-specific seminar, for example, for South Africa, who right at the moment are experiencing load shedding, and they're looking at an emergency procurement which is gas-driven? And it just yeah. seems incongruous given our renewable energy resources. So uh, I just wondered if you could yeah, help. I'm happy to consider it. Just happy to consider it. Just send me an email and maybe describe more the possible talk and audience. Yeah, you know, I'll consider it. Thanks. That's brilliant. Good afternoon, Mark. This is Richard Vanderveen in Marquette, Michigan. How are you? Hi. Can you hear me? Yeah, yeah, I can hear you. Okay. Uh, we are we are meshed, of course, in a uh, national campaign that wraps up uh, November third. And I'm just wondering about your perspectives on a second Trump term versus <laughs> a a Biden term. Uh, actually, like uh, this is a technical uh, presentation, therefore I would like to keep those uh, questions having political overtones, uh, please, offline. Thank you, Mark, for your excellent work. Yeah, thank you. Thanks, I appreciate it. Looks like there are no more questions, Mark, and I'll consult with Mark regarding the, uh, some initial recording, especially due to the technical grades. And I would like to thank Liz for her help when I was having a technical problem uh, issues. And thank you so much for your presentation, Mark, and thank you so much for all the participants and the interesting question. Uh, we'll try to get this recording intact uh, with the help of Mark, and I'll update with you all and with that, uh, I would like to conclude the presentation of uh, Wind World Force that today. Thank you, Mark, and thank you, everybody. Thanks, Ron. Thanks, everybody. Appreciate it.